cool. Hey, I'm here with Chris Vandergriff. Um, Chris, you were um, you were just working very hard on the Innova Open. Um, can I first ask you how you got started with disc golf? Like, what hooked you? Oh gosh, um, uh, I've been playing for 23 years or so. Started in 2000. I uh, I was growing up. I was always the the BMX, taekwondo, baseball, football, dirt bikes, uh, hacky stack, frisbee, whatever kind of guy. And uh, me and my friends used to throw the freestyle frisbee a lot. One of my old neighbors saw us throwing, and he said, "Hey, have you ever played frisbee golf?" And I go, "No, but you know, sure, let's do it." Uh, he took me out to a local course, put a DX Stinger, I'm sorry, a DX Scorpion in my hand. And uh, I, I being the master of the freestyle frisbee that I was, uh, an arrogant 20 something, I thought, you know, uh, I'm going to be great at this already. And indeed, I was not. Uh, the the <laughs> DX Stingray, the disc golf discs, flew quite a bit differently than what it, than traditional freestyle frisbees. Um, but that hooked me, you know, I, I got hooked on the science of it. You know, I, I was always the kid that, you know, down at the ditch, you know, there's a rock 40 yards away, you know, a big stone or a log in the deal. And, you know, we, we threw rocks at it until you hit it, you know, and then you oh, find yeah. the next conquest. That was me. And that was, uh, with disc golf, it was the same, you know, I, I loved the science of it. You know, I was okay. I can throw this and make it do this and that. I remember too, seeing the guys with, with a, a bunch of discs in their bag. And I was like, I can beat those guys with just one. And, you know, fast forward oh, yeah. six months. Yeah, I was the guy <laughs> with, you know, I had the end of a bag and the whole blah, 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 and CD plastic and all that kind of thing. And uh, I, I just got hooked really quick. You know, I, I loved it. And then, you know, fast forward to where we're at. Uh, disc golf, there, there's a, a part of my story is that uh, disc golf changed my life in 2008, 2009. A, a friendship made on the disc golf course um, led to some substantial life changes for me. And uh, I just, I, I started giving back to the sport. I, I wanted to jump in and do what I could because of that. I, I saw that a shared passion could foster these kind of friendships. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, just, I mean, I started helping out at the minis, carrying coolers back in, carrying tent baskets back in, helping people load and this and that. And then fast forward to where we are today, you know. Totally. And there's something about creative, competent people who, recognize the value of the community that they're in and once sure. you once you've found that you it's so natural to be drawn to tournaments to operations to management and sure. finding ways to give your skill sets back to the community for those who love the sport as much as you yeah. um i remember yeah i i'm just a covid golfer myself i picked up a practice set in 2020 and okay i was immediately hooked uh, you know two months later jumped in a motorhome did a cross provincial tour playing like 25 courses in eight days and taking uh all the tips I could from anybody. And a couple of years later, uh, done some Shopify partner work for some disc golf retailers, getting their stores all spruced up and um, studying flight paths to make those like searchable filters and stuff. And even going as far as making a disc golf board game. Uh, well, that I want to get into the community because I, I think about how much, we want to play throughout the winter or I think about those who um, have other commitments and ha have a more like a balanced life that can't live, eat, breathe disc golf. Uh, and so bringing it into the home, maybe for those who want to throw a far shot, but can't do it on the course anymore, you know, just, uh, yeah. Gotcha. Making sure it's successful uh, to everybody. Um, cool. So describe the experience of designing this, these, uh, these courses in Brock park. So, I, I've gotten involved in course design. I, I fortunately had a couple of great mentors. Uh, I've got to drop the name Jim Kelly. Uh, he's a Colorado pro. He was he lived here in Houston. He and I kind of came through the advanced ranks and turned pro. Uh, he was a year before me. I was right after. We we had some great battles, but we also shared a lot of this you know similar insight. He pointed out a few things to me that that stuck as far as course design, and and I kind of ran with them. Uh, a funny story is that the first course that I ever played in two thousand. I had the opportunity three years ago to actually do the redesign and, and reinstall of that course. Um, when I, I've designed a couple courses, one namely uh, Evergreen Flyways in Baytown, Texas, that was on a former traditional golf course. I was very aware of the stigma of traditional golf courses 
transitioning into a disc golf course and again the stigma is associated with that okay open fairways took this here and there um it had become my mission and goal to steer as far away from that stigma as possible we were very successful with that at evergreen granted uh, we didn't have a lot of trees etc cetera, et cetera, to work with but we utilized them as best we could the key component of that was that as opposed to say a a neighborhood golf course where you had one entry point and you had to follow the fairways and kind of a map um, at the evergreen project was expansive and we were able to cross over and, and go with whatever directions that we wanted. Uh, as far as Brock Park goes, we had a very similar, uh, we, we had the absence of, of, of those traditional restraints or restrictions we'll say. So I had a, a big piece of property and I got to cut in and out of it as best I could. Now, um, Scotty Linthicum, I can't go into this thing without adding Scotty to this. He was the 100% co-designer. He and I were 50-50 on this project. He actually led the design on the FPO side, which was the Brock Modified course. Yes. Um, to go into that, Scotty Linthicum, his wife was the former touring pro, Christina Linthicum. She's had some health issues that kept her from touring, et cetera, et cetera. And he had been on her bag for many years and seen the struggles that some of these FBO had had playing the men's courses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and he championed a complete FPO style course. He pulled me back and twisted me different ways. And you got to think about this. You got to think about that. Cause that's a perspective that I didn't have. So um, designing Brock Park, the main goal was design a course that, was outside of the traditional parameters and stigmas of a traditional golf course turned into a golf course. What worked in our favor was that there were old growth, mature trees dividing most of the fairways on this property. Mm. We were able to stay within, stay in those trees mostly. And then uh, what helped us also disc golf, as far as the disc golf pro tour and spectators were concerned, is that we uh, we created essentially spectator fingers from those fairways. So great access points, uh, use lots of trees. That was the nuts and bolts of it. I had never considered uh, trees for access points. and But I really understand how like old growth trees would really set um, set the tone, set the stage sure. for everything else to be, um, I suppose, a more actionable, like a purposeful uh, tree for obstacles and such, whereas those are really defining the borders of, of a hole. Um, when sure. I was trying to figure out how to make all players equal for the, for the board game, um, I thought, okay, I want everybody to be able to throw the same distances. But of course, when you, when you're dealing with uh, FPO versus MPO, um, being able to curate a course that lets them, well, not blow their arms out and actually, you know, be able to rely on uh, more of their skill sets like touch and finesse rather than just trying to get the distance shot after shot uh i think that's a really nice thing that for them to do um and it it, it honors the, their talents so i'm really excited that, that that was done i'm sure that the players absolutely loved it we we got some great feedback um i, I was able to convey some of the feedback from some of the top fpo ladies and uh you know, shot that over to scotty and he loved it you know mission accomplished we we uh <laughs> We'd already been thinking about improvements after we came up with this design, knowing that we couldn't change anything before the event, but we, you know, we'll work on even bigger and better next year. So, you know, yeah. you know, something else about that Brock mod design was that we realized this going in is that we wanted to have the, we had the A tier running concurrently with the DGPT silver side. Um, we wanted to have the pro age protected men uh, and the advanced uh, advanced men and the M forties, uh, play the same course and we saw a great opportunity that this course albeit not as long as a pro 40s or m1 course would traditionally be designed to their skill set um this course with the ob placements shot placements and some distance etc cetera, etc cetera, would carry over would, would overlap both of those skill sets and mm -hmm. some of the bigger arm pro 40s that had reached out to me during the event and afterwards and said hey man there's fantastic scoring separation on this that was some feedback that i was if i was apprehensive or a little cautious about some of the feedback i was going to get it was going to be from those bigger arm pro 40s and it was very reassuring when these guys reached out to me afterwards and said hey man this thing scored really well we appreciate it even 
Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, that, that is one, so cool. Yeah, it, it really was, you know, the, a ton of unique opportunities with this one. Um, it, it, and for it to work out how we thought it was, it, it, it's reassuring. You know, I, I try to stay right size and I try to stay modest. I, I'm a nose to the grindstone kind of guy and one foot in front of the other, but to, to, to put all this effort into it and then have it received how we wanted, it was fantastic. Um, designing courses for the um, for the game, I'd, I'd like to show you a um, little thing here. What what we've done is um, we've created eighteen different flight paths of different speeds and stabilities. I don't know if you can see here. You've got approach, mid, and driver discs, um, okay. each of which are made of a clear acetate, so you can flip them over for backhand or forehand, and those get overlaid on the hole itself. And so we've got different holes with um, different tee pads to choose from, all of similar uh, distances, but different angles of approach. And we I've essentially reverse engineered the holes to ensure that there's there's lines through them, there's different percentages of gaps, and um, you combine that with in-air wind adjustments, and you've got a highly replayable course. So it's been a lot of fun to put together. Um, whereas this was a sort of a from scratch conceptual course. Um, when I started working on uh, recreating courses, for example, the USDGC, um, well, once I've got an illustrator here, we'll get it looking much more like the course in real life, but really had to focus on which types of throws the pros were making and make sure that those lines had similar consequences or had similar distances and sort of reverse engineered the hole from where the basket was to each type of shot to work their way back to the tee pad. So that was a lot of fun. Gotcha. Um, in, in my opinion there, you said a couple key things, uh, reverse engineering the hole. I think it's as important as, as a designer to look at the hole from basket to tee as it is from tee to basket. Uh, and you also, I heard you say percentages of gaps in there. And that's, that's huge for me. You know, uh, you, you asked a question and I hope I'm not jumping ahead too much, but you said, ask for me to consider what is a tree and it, 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 what a tree is everything from a landmark to aesthetics to, uh, 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 it marks a landing zone. It's what I have to beat. It's, it's a million different design qualities in one you know this is i need to beat that tree on this side i need to go there i need to go you know one of the things that we did with the brock gold course is that there were some uh a, a lot of low-hanging foliage and stuff in some of the areas mm -hmm. we trimmed some of that up strategically to mimic um alleys and flight paths you know uh hole one for example there were three distinct landing zones you know you could either go for it big and try to beat the mando beat the big broccoli tree of uh, with yep. the flex shot that was, you know, right in the line of sight. Uh, and if you made it around that without going out of bounds, very strategic out of bounds, left side, then you were in prime position. Uh, if you went too far right, you had to deal with the low hanging trees. We were very specific. We brought the, uh, we, we brought the, the ceiling up on the left side, or if you went, the, I, there wasn't as many people that took the simple basic hyzer off the tee, but if you took that simple tee, simple hyzer off the tee, you had a great landing zone where you essentially cut the hole in half. You had a, a hyzer shot, right hand, backhand, and then you had a dead straight fairway shot of about 300 feet, but 280, right. 100, that puts you right there. And, and that's that's segmenting a hole into having to plan multiple shots. That's, that's taking big arms uh, and making them plan, not just rely on, you know, sure. um, absolute cannons and that's i think that's so much fun i like seeing sure. them used as backstops too i think that's really fun watching people oh, yeah. it's still a gamble but if they they like the if they like the numbers and they throw it high and wait for that yeah. wait for that hang time and yeah. say okay it trickle me down you know that yeah. let's uh let's lose some distance intentionally i love no. that I, I, I try not to get, I, I, I love percentages. I love landing zones. I love distance control. You know, if you throw too far, then you have to deal with some stuff. At the yeah. same time, uh, I am a, uh, I, I'm a kid that loves to see the Frisbees fly too. You know, if uh, I oh, want to yeah. let you, you want to take this big shot and get there, then go for it. You know, the, here's your risk reward. Please, I, I, I don't want to limit people. You know, something else too is that I don't want to make a, uh, for a disc golf pro tour event, I didn't want to make hole one too hard. You know, I didn't want to stress these guys out too much off the tee. Not off the tee, no. Yeah, off tee one, 
go out there throw you know get you a birdie if you if you got it you know don't <laughs> struggle too much and, and then you know let, let your round materialize yeah and that and then there's the other aspect of uh course design that i one of my favorites is what makes a um what makes circle two fun okay you yeah. know um I've, I've incorporated a couple of different putting mechanics into the game where there's a, a tap in area where you're not going to be penalized for you're not there's no gamble when you land close enough you've got increasing percentages for uh role strategies within circle one but then circle two is so interesting because um what was combined with course design there's varying degrees of punishment there's roll away opportunities there's water hazards there's and then elevation and this beautiful combination of pressure and uh, you combine that with the tournament pressure or their position on the card and uh it's really just changes things a lot um what i decided to do for circle two in in the disc golf board game was double up the amount of dice rather than needing to hit that high number you now have got a sweet spot of seven or eight with 2d6 to hit that sweet spot otherwise we're ricocheting off the basket or we're duffing it and going short or if you're throwing over that eight with a 2d6 you are going the full the full distance of your shot and um you need to know what's behind the basket so uh and if you're if you're not in control of that then you could make the conscious decision to maybe use one of your approach discs and just lay up wow that's uh that's well thought out that's well thought out i i, I have to say i was very curious about how the board game was going to lay out and stuff and you you've done a lot of work that's there's a, there's a lot of uh a lot of detail, a lot of considerations in that. I, I'm I'm interested. Thanks. We also yeah. added, made sure that there were uh, putting minus like negative bonuses for every tree or rock or bush that you're putting over, because at the end of the day, it, it's not it's not your practice basket. It's not your parkade with no wind and no obstacles. Yeah, you, uh, gotcha. Um, the final question I wanted to ask from you was, what makes a signature hole? Oh gosh, um, yeah, 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 that that's a tough question. Um, a signature hole. I, I think it's got to be a combination of things. Um, there there was a hole, hole eleven on the Brock Gold Course is one of the signature holes, and we when we were out there designing it, we knew that that was a it was a cornerstone of the course. It would this this was a gateway in in how we were able to use how we were able to bridge the front end and the back nine. It, we knew that whichever direction we went on this certain hole um, was going to have a tremendous effect on the rest of the course. There was a big stone. There was a pond, old growth trees. We knew that something was fantastic there. We actually spent three days on the layout of that hole. We knew the back, how we wanted to finish. We, and we, we knew that that was a missing link. Um, I think to make a signature hole, there's got to be aesthetics for sure. There's got to be topographical features for sure. Yeah. Um, it, it's got to be designed well in the aspect of, you know, gosh, it, it could have multiple lines. It could have one singular line. Mm, like but the it, line that's almost impossible to throw. So you've yeah. got like throwing over or near water, maybe unique ground play, precarious pin placement or, or tight lines, maybe a combination of long distances, high elevation shots. The things sure. that will bring the gallery and just clog that area and say, I dare you to make that shot. Sure, sure. You know, a couple different ways to attack it. And who's going to take the uh, the high risk line, the, the the big risk reward with all the oohs and ahs from the gallery, you know, or, mm. or, or at the same note, um, we, the guy that plays it the safe route perfectly is his birdie is that as exciting to watch? Like, can you see it and go, he peered that, that gap, he peered the safe gap, hit the landing zone and then peered the upshot. Is that you know, all of those things come into play? You know, so what makes a signature hole, it, it could be a combination of, of, of a ton of things, you know, it could just be, I, I think the way that you use, got to have the aesthetics. I feel it, it's got to be aesthetically pleasing. It's got to be beautiful. It's got to have some features, but I think, what makes a signature hole is the proper use of those aesthetics and those features. And the, you know, again, I'll, I'll go back to 
hole 11 is in my mind one of the signature holes while it may not be the most beautiful it was just this fantastic dog leg right and you had three ways to get to a landing zone we had distance control we had what we were calling the michael johansson gap shout out to uh to, to michael johansson um which was a tighter gap on the right we had a, a bigger forehand or turnover line going out over the pond where you had to exhibit distance control or execute distance control the finish of the hole had you're probably 25, 28 feet from the basket, there was a, a beautiful little kidney-shaped pond. So you had to find the landing zone here, then you had to choose your way of attack, and you had to, you had to play the hole right, and there were several different ways to play it. You know, I love that. Trees and, and all that stuff. That was, in, now on another note, um, hole 17 is one of my favorites because uh, it, it offered, you know, you, you had a couple different ways. If you went a big hyzer, you had to rely on skip your OB the whole way. Beautiful fairway that that played, that that allowed you to, you know, kind of a hyzer flip turnover mash and get way down there. Or even a, a left hander could force one over, uh, even a big flick. But undulating terrain, several different landing zones, and then you know some up and down, uh, up and down green by the basket. That, again, that was one of my favorites. I I, I, I love was, that. There's something about letting each player's profile shine in a specific way and say, oh, you, you know, this whole let you play your game rather than um, play the course. Like you're playing the course, but sometimes the course says you play like this. Yes, so. I, I, I feel it was a, hey, pretty obvious. This is where you need to be. How you get there is up to you. And then that will let you approach the green in, in several different ways. And then we had a, a nice rolling green and, you know, a little feature that I haven't heard mentioned too much is that, you know, we're in Texas, we're in Houston, we're in oil city. Um, there were some pipeline signs on the green of that and stuff. And we thought about covering those up, but we left those kind of intentionally, you know, where it'd be on coverage, you know, at blah, 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 pipeline, this and that. We, we also had some, uh, we don't get a lot of elevation change here. I think we use that really really well hole three hole 18 had some really dramatic greens you know those those create signature holes as well when yep. used properly so absolutely yeah yeah i'm having fun with um trying to make sure that everyone feels like they can play a, their own particular style um for for the game as well and one thing i'm working with uh, not allowed to use these photos or anything if this is just placeholders for now while the illustration sure. being done but being able to give people unique abilities to um, have a stamina bar for their mental game and for their yeah. mental fortitude and um, maybe just that extra bit of power or maybe an extra little bit of finesse or accuracy, just making sure that everyone's got feels represented and um, can play a certain way. Right on. Like it. Yeah. That's very cool. No, we're having a lot of fun with it, but Hey, thank you so much for, uh, for jumping on Chris. Uh, Innova Open was such a treat to watch on the Disc Golf Network, and I, oh, I mean, as a Canadian, we it's not like I can just jump jump on a in my car and go quickly go hit an event. So sometimes this is as close as I get. But gotcha. getting cool. to see all the coverage is um it's such a treat, and and watching people navigate this beautiful piece of property that you guys curated, an incredible courses on, I uh. Cool. Really, really stoked to, to have a chance to meet you. Cool. Well, thanks, man. I, I appreciate it. Uh, we were, I, I, to be quite honest, I was just happy to uh, to provide that for the people in my area. You know, uh, we did something good. It was well received, and and that reverberates through the community. And that that's what I'm really. That's my main focus. But um, yeah, it, man, it was so great to have it well received. Thanks for reaching out to me. Um. Glad you loved it. Next year, we're mm -hmm. shooting for a league series. Next year, we know uh, exactly where to make the little improvements and stuff like that and make it even uh, make it even bigger and better. Amazing. I can't wait to see it. Fantastic. Thank you so much.